Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 188 of the Mo Money Podcast. I am your host, Jessica Morehouse. Thanks for joining me for another episode. This one's going to be a good one, as all my episodes are, really. Um, but I feel like I am so close. Like I feel like I've got 90% of all the personal finance experts in Canada. They've been on the show. Uh, there's a few that are still elusive, so I'm going to try to get them on the show. But I feel like I almost have like a complete set of all the money experts. You kind of know who I'm talking about. You know, they're on TV or they have books. They're kind of those people you think of when you think of a personal finance expert uh, in Canada. And so for this episode, I have the one and only Leslie Ann Scorgi on the show. She is the founder of MeVest, which is, a, if you don't know, a leading edge uh, financial education company specializing in money coaching for Canadians. Um, and how she got her start, which we talk about in this episode. Episode is she in 2001 she was on the Oprah Winfrey show because she was kind of featured as this super young smart person who figured out how to um, basically make money uh, interesting and not boring and just like how to manage your money in a very simple and easy to understand way and that obviously skyrocketed her career. And now she's on TV. She has two books and she's a columnist for the Toronto Star. She's everywhere. So we talk about all that good stuff um, and all the kind of tips that she uh, has for you in this episode. Before I get to that interview with Leslie Ann, here's just a few words about this episode's sponsor. This episode of the Mo Money podcast is supported by Sonnet Insurance. How much are you paying for home, auto, or tenant insurance? Better yet, do you know what's in your insurance policy? If you don't know, you're not alone. In Sonnet's recent survey, they discovered that one in three Canadians haven't read their home and auto insurance policies either, which is why Sonnet stands out from other insurance companies. They've rewritten all their policy documents so you can actually understand how you're being protected without the needless jargon. And if you have questions, they're on standby via live chat, email, or give their award-winning customer service team a call to speak to a real human. Sonnet's aim isn't just to protect its clients, but to make the whole insurance process easy. Don't believe me? Visit sonnet.ca to get a quote online in just five minutes. It's really that easy. And one of the reasons I switched over to Sonnet myself. Try it out yourself by visiting sonnet.ca. Once again, that's sonnet.ca. Thanks, Leslie, for joining me on the show. I'm so excited to finally have you on. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're so welcome. So right before this, um, and you're probably going to think this is a little silly, but I obviously did a, a ton of Googling, but I saw the um, Oprah segment you did. Ah, I can't, it was so, so cute. Ago. You were so adorable. <laughs> I was 17 when that happened. I it mean, seems like a lifetime crazy. ago. I know. Well, yeah, I didn't realize because I've always known, you know, it's been on like your website and stuff like, oh, you've been on Oprah. But I didn't realize it was when you were 17 and you were kind of like, you know, it was a whole segment about, you know, successful young people. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know. It, it's still a claim to fame because the Oprah effect is real. Is and it? the influence that she had on my life so early shaped everything that I have done since then, including writing my books and then um, developing my business, it all started back then when yeah. I was invited on her show to talk about young people saving money and why that's important and how I've been able to save quite a bit of money, more mm -hmm. than my parents, in fact, um, which was really mm -hmm. like the hook for the yeah. show. They thought that was very unique and, and interesting and a little strange. Uh, albeit um, mm -hmm. positively strange, but yeah. it was it was a little strange. So uh, that's how I ended up on the show was uh, being discovered because of my hab my savings habits mm -hmm. and uh, how they had kind of caught the attention of different local newspapers, and then it got picked up on the newswire by the producers of the Oprah Winfrey Show. And before I knew it, I was meeting her face to face, and then my whole career kicked off wow. right after that. Wow. So how did you, cause I feel like this was, so this was back in 2001, you were, when you went on the Oprah show. So that was like a long time ago, probably before blogging was the thing. Like how, yeah. how were you just like, how did these newspapers find out about you? Cause the internet uh, was so early. It was <laughs> so random, um, which is why today I still believe uh, in a little bit of luck and timing yeah. always. 
but I had a fantastic teacher in my grade 12 year. Her name was Ms. Lavinyak, and she was teaching a class on um, money management. And when I was growing up in Alberta, that was not part of like mandatory curriculum. Mm. It was touched upon in like the career and life management course, but for her to have taken a few different classes to dedicate exclusively to personal finance and debt and how to balance a checkbook was like pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So it was like during those classes where I obviously was shining because I love the subject and was able to actually like contribute very meaningfully to that discussion in the classroom. And so um, she actually responded to a call that came into the school which was uh, from the local newspaper, um, which was the Calgary Herald at that Mm -hmm. time. And they were asking if there were like any odd or interesting students that they could profile. Mm. And it was, that's, that's like the, the strange part about it is it just happened to be that same week that she was doing these courses um, with our class, this, this money Mm -hmm. management uh, class. And so she volunteered me. And she said, well, Leslie Ann's pretty interesting. Like she's very young and she has saved quite a bit of money uh, and her financial acumen is quite extensive. Like you should profile her. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they did. And that, that article got picked up um, nationally in Canada and then it got picked up internationally which is what uh, the producers of the Oprah Winfrey show found on the Newswire. So that is how it all happened. Wow. That's really crazy. Even just like the, it is kind of luck in that, you know, timing wise and then newspaper calling the school because they need a story and they're looking for a student. Like that is actually so crazy, but I I kind of believe in destiny a little bit. So it's like maybe meant to be right. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's a balance, right? You, we create a lot of our own destiny, Mm -hmm. but some of it is, luck. Yeah. Being at the right time, right place kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it it sounds like you've always been kind of interested in finance and you always, it's been pretty good at kind of implementing lots of the the tools and and, and advice out there. What, what did draw you to personal finance? Because most people don't (laughs) ever feel super passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a weirdo because I love it too. And it wasn't until my twenties that I kind of started like realizing, oh, this is actually really cool. What kind of drew you to it initially? And so young, especially in your teenage years. It was actually not a fantastic story that drew me to it. (laughs) Um, It's sad. I grew up in a home where we had very little Mm -hmm. and my parents struggled financially every single day. Uh, until they divorced. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I grew up with um, fighting about money. Mm-hmm. Um, also, my interest in reading that helped me. So I was working at um, the library when I was 14. But pr- prior to that, I would go to the library and like rent books from the library. And I got on to um, the author Jeffrey Archer mm-hmm. when I was about 10 years old. Wow, which is like so early material. (laughs) Like I was, I think I was reading Nancy Drew's at (laughs) ten. Yeah, well, and I too like would Mm. read Nancy Drew and the Babysitters Club. Mm -hmm. um, But I got into like adult fiction early, and um, much to my mother's disappointment, she was always concerned that I was consuming materials that were above my comprehension. And Mm. she's probably not right, not wrong about that, Mm -hmm. um, because there were some adult parts in there, but um. The Jeffrey Archer books were all about like rags to riches stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thrived with my reading uh, because of those stories. I couldn't put the books down. I thought I could be these people. They had nothing. They, they created completely different lives for themselves, starting from absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And then it grew my appetite uh, so shortly after that, my mom bought me The Wealthy Barber. Um, mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, she- that is literally the book that everyone, I, for me yeah. too, That's it is such a great book. <laughs> yeah, and well, she bought it actually mostly for herself yeah. and my dad, <laughs> and then was like, hey, you can have this too, um, which 
I, I, I consumed that like in two days. Mm-hmm. And then I started reading um, David Box, Automatic Millionaire. Yeah. And as you can imagine, it was like this, this whole like um, empowerment around money started through literature for me. And also the escapism of the literature, I think allowed me to get out of the situation in the home where it was always so tense mm-hmm. and always about money and just never, ever enough. So long story short, I don't think fear-based motivation is is a really good thing. Agreed. (laughs) For me, happened to turn into a good thing, but I don't promote fear-based motivation. Mm -hmm. I like really don't recommend parents use that uh, Mm -hmm. tactic with their children. Um, I just think uh, for, I think I was like kind of lucky again to get myself to where I am today and turn that fear-based motivation into like really positive Mm -hmm. choices for my life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I feel like that's especially like you learned that so early, but I feel like that, that whole sentiment of um, getting rid of the idea of, uh, you know, money means fear or worry or stress or anxiety or shame or blame or all that kind of stuff. Like, I feel like, especially with younger people and millennials, they don't like that stuff. It's not working for them. It may have worked for other generations, but we're looking for something a little bit more maybe in depth or just something that's, you know, like you said, the reason I think a lot of us get into personal finance or people listen to this show is because it's all about positivity and what you, what money could do for you, not you what it. it restricts you. And that's exactly like you said, I like, I love those rakes to riches stories because it gives me hope. And I think that's another thing that we're all looking for. It's like, we're looking for hope at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love talking to my clients about like loving their money and Mm -hmm. like making choices that reflect the things they love. And I think that is a way more positive tact to take with, with clients Mm -hmm. or even in parenting um, when you're talking about finances, because if we have like passion and love guide us, uh, we make, and we make our financial decisions based on the Mm -hmm. things that we love and, and, you know, kind of get rid of the things that we don't love. Uh, we end up spending different. We feel Mm -hmm. different about ourselves. We make different choices with our careers and typically, um, achieve a higher level of financial success when Mm -hmm. we, when we lead with, with good thinking and Mm -hmm. we focus on the things we love and just don't waste money Mm -hmm. on the stuff that is mediocre. Yeah. And I feel like too, um, those are just really good attributes to have, like, uh, associating money with, you know, love and just happiness and, uh, your values. Uh, It helps you in other things, uh, in personal finance, like specifically when it comes to investing, if you have that kind of fear-based mentality, you may not take as many risks, which could help you down the road to reach your financial goals sooner. But if you do come from a place of, of, you know, first off, obviously understanding what you're doing, but, um, you know, kind of that confidence and, and loving your money, you may be more inclined to not just tuck your money in a savings account because you're afraid of losing it all in the next market crash. Mm -hmm. And like for those who are just starting out, it's all about loving yourself Mm -hmm. enough to save, right? Like it's, yeah, it's Mm -hmm. thinking that you are worth it and that you will make sacrifices, but it's for the love of your future. And like, if you can get that through, um, you know, through your head and through your heart, it really can guide your entire financial life. Absolutely. And I think that's a big thing that um, uh, I see with people struggling with debt is they almost don't believe that they deserve a life outside of debt because that's all that they're used to. And it's just like, you know, like you said, it's like if you can kind of switch that mindset and, you know, it's really about kind of taking care of yourself, that kind of self-care mentality, you'll be able to live a life that is way better than you expected and is possible for all of us. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as you mentioned, Oprah effect is real. Uh, you have had an amazing career starting at the ripe age of 17. So you, you went to university and got a bachelor's and you got an MBA. Um, you, you mentioned in that Oprah segment though, that you were, um, striving to become a millionaire at 25. Were you able to achieve that goal? No, it was a few (laughs) years later. I think I was a little aggressive. I mean, that's an ambitious goal, but you know, (laughs) Yeah, no, um, no, definitely not, not quite 25. Um, but, uh, it was definitely a few years later. However, 
I think the foundation to getting mm-hmm. to that point was laid well before 25. Um, yeah. like it's, it's exactly what I talked to my youngest, uh, readers and clients about, which is, um, getting that foundation set up mm-hmm. in your early twenties, even if you're not able to like participate to your max or you're not making the max amount of money, if you can set up all the right pieces and you start working your program Mm -hmm. or your plan, um, it does start to crescendo. Uh, And a decade later, you could be in a position where you're, you know, a a couple hundred thousand dollars in net worth. And in my case, because I set the foundation so early, um, you know, achieving my financial goals of being a millionaire, uh, it happened a little later than 25, Mm -hmm. but I was able to get there. And and Mm -hmm. gosh, it meant a lot. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important thing to note because a lot of the things that I always see, you know, in the media is those splashy stories like, you know, 25 year old becomes a millionaire. And it, at some point, it's it's a bit inspirational, but it can also be kind of um, disheartening as someone who are like, well, I'm older than that. And I don't have as much money. Maybe it's too late for me. But like you said, mm-hmm. it's like, even if you uh, start just starting now, it's never too late and set that foundation, make that a priority. You can one day still achieve that. It may not be as soon as you think, but if you achieve it eventually, that's still a success. Absolutely. Absolutely. And everybody has a different program. That's Mm -hmm. the other thing. Like Mm -hmm. my program, you know, I was so laser focused Mm -hmm. on, um, becoming a millionaire. Like I couldn't get off of it. Right. Like I, And I sacrificed so much to Mm -hmm. get there. And if I could do it over again, I probably would have taken my foot off the gas a little bit Mm -hmm. and enjoyed my money uh, a lot more in my 20s than than I did. But hey, you know Mm -hmm. what? You learn. And here I am. uh, I'm very, very grateful to have the financial security that I have. I'm also very grateful to have a partner who is of the same mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, But I tell you, there are, there are some real benefits I have now, but it definitely, it came at a bit of a cost. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like any kind of big lofty goal you have, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. And Mm -hmm. in hindsight, you know, you might be like, "Hmm, I wish I kind of enjoyed myself a little bit better, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to where you are. <laughs> like, eh, what you yeah. do? <laughs> um, so one of the things you've been able to do in your career is you authored four different books, which is crazy to me. Um, so you have Rich by 30, you have Rich by 40, um, Well Healed, The Smart Girl's Guide to Getting Rich. So that's kind of focusing more on women. And then you have The Modern Couple's Money Guide, which I, I love that because I feel like uh, you're kind of talking to those 20 somethings talking about, you know, uh, getting that wealth, that financial foundation by 30, and then uh, building your net worth uh, in your 40 or by 40. And then talking to specifically with women, which I think is really important, because um, as a woman, I felt like I was never part of the conversation in terms of finance until I uh, entered my kind of 20s and started learning more about that. And then of course, money and couples is a very interesting topic that I think we can talk for hours about. Um, oh, but yeah. yeah, exactly. So what inspired you to to kind of first with your rich buy kind of series about, you know, 30 and 40, what kind of inspired you to write those first books? Well, rich by 30 was fairly natural progression from the Oprah Winfrey experience. It mm-hmm. was a easy for me to move into that thinking after having the power of her brand uh, kind of endorse me. Um, I put together the roadmap for that book. I knew there wasn't a ton on the market uh, from a young woman Mm -hmm. for young people. And it gave Rich by 30 a real dynamic edge. Um, The book business had also not suffered from the digitization of literature as it has today. Um, At that time in 2007, when Rich by 30 came out and I was 23 um, and very flexible too, I was able to market the book, travel across the country. Um, It went international as an Mm -hmm. international bestseller. Um, and I worked it <laughs> like yeah. it was my full-time gig. Mm-hmm. Um, and we went through print run after print run after print run. And it was like an incredible success. Um, and I am so grateful for that. I had a, like an excellent agent, a really good publisher. Um, 
And it was a real pleasure to, Mm -hmm. to write that book. Um, it's subsequently been published, uh, again, like we, we refreshed the content, Mm -hmm. um, a few times just to make it a little bit more relevant and update it with the times. Absolutely. Um, but the last refresh was just a few years ago and uh, it's still, you know, it's still a very compelling, um, title on, Mm -hmm. on the shelves also because the name is annoying rich by 30 is very arrogant (laughs) um so you'll have a good chuckle about this but um shortly after that I uh was signed to write rich by 40 Mm -hmm. and we made a fatal marketing error which was we named it rich by 40 Mm -hmm. so when it came out even though like the actual contents of the book were excellent like way better Mm -hmm. than rich by 30 um, the, the book didn't sell nearly as oh. well as the first. And we had this like fatal marketing error on our hands, which we figured out was the fact that, uh, when folks were going into bookstores or online, they would look at the two titles mm-hmm. and they would simply say, what would I rather be rich mm-hmm. by 30 or rich by 40? Right. And so when rich by 40 came out, my rich by 30 sales soared again, Ah! (laughs) like they went up and we had like, okay, sales on rich by 40. Mm -hmm. They were fine, but they were not nearly as strong as, as rich by 30. So Mm. funny, funny story there. Um, yeah, I and guess people I, just think the rich by 30, like, oh, that's something I want to aspire to rich by 40, which is still something that most people, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> should aspire to. It's like, eh, I'd rather be rich by 30. Totally <laughs> right. It's human, human nature. Yeah, that's so fair. Mm. it was a really funny um, outcome that we had. And then um, Key Porter Books, uh, who was my publisher, actually uh, went bankrupt uh, mm. shortly after that, that uh, shortly after rich by 30. Uh, 40 came out. Um, and that was just so unfortunate that you saw so many of yep. the publishers at that time not be able to kind of turn with the tide mm-hmm. towards the digital um, trends in literature. Uh, Key Porter was one of one of the companies that just wasn't able to kind of keep their their ship steady. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a few years later that I signed with Dundurn Press uh, for Well Healed uh, and Modern Couples Money Guide. Uh, and they've been a pleasure to work with. And both of those books were oh, so much fun to write. Mm-hmm. Like I loved writing Well Healed, um, you know, from a woman's perspective for mm-hmm. women um, on a subject that I, you know, I'm so passionate about. But I am extra passionate about women taking control of their finances um, Mm -hmm. because I've just seen so many women do amazing things. Like they're such good money managers when they just take the time to learn it. And I, nothing irks me more than when I hear a woman say, Oh, I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you're lazy. <laughs> if you don't get it, um, it means you haven't taken the time. And I can tell you when women take the time to learn how to like master their money, they are better yeah. at it than men. And we have statistics every year that get published that yeah. fact. So I just don't buy it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I 100% believe that. I feel like when I am talking to women, because I, I believe, I, I completely agree. It's like women are super capable. Once they understand the path or the steps they need to take, they'll do it. But I think a lot of it comes down to maybe they, they don't know where to start. And so they, yes. they just don't start. Or they have that, I, I like this term has been floating around for a while. And it, it really does make a lot of sense. Is this financial confidence issue. Uh, because we were never really part of this kind of financial conversation for decades. It's only kind of been in the the most recent decade, I'd say, that we're kind of becoming more involved. Uh, When we are in conversations with people about money, we're afraid of making a mistake or saying the wrong thing and looking like an idiot. So we almost like exit out or just like, "Ah, I don't want to be involved or, oh, I'll just leave that to a professional to deal with me and I just don't want to. And it's Mm -hmm. like, that's something like, you know, with you and your, um, your books and your speaking and all the things that you do, it's awesome that you're hopefully trying to reverse that and fix that. Cause I think there's, like you said, it's like, we're so capable 
of being the best money managers out there. And I, I agree. Like my mom was the family money manager and she is still so great at it. And so I learned that from her. I'm like, Oh no, women are great money managers. Um, mm. but I think a lot of women I talk to also have this idea. They're like, Oh no, I'm just bad with money. <laughs> yeah, which is like bizarre. Cause it's like, where does that come from? Mm-hmm. And it's rooted in confidence. Yeah. Lack of confidence. I should be more clear. And it's an issue that like, until I go to my grave, I will mm-hmm. always fight for women's empowerment Absolutely. Uh, finance because we also know that when women are empowered, they make such incredible choices, mm-hmm. not only for themselves, but for their families and also the community. So like it trickles over into the way they run yep. their businesses, into the way like they operate their careers, the choices they make, who they hire, you know, it's, it's just like, this empowerment trickles Mm -hmm. into so many like fantastic aspects of a woman's life. So Mm -hmm. yeah, let's Mm -hmm. just keep talking about it. (laughs) Keep talking about it. Um, And so one of the things that you also do is you have your own kind of financial planning firm called MeVest. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that got started? I mean, obviously seems like a natural fit with everything you're doing. (laughs) Yeah. MeVest has started um, in 2014 and it was, started out of a response for um, more personalized uh, money coaching for Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was to tackle this whole issue around financial confidence. And um, when I started out, I had two paths in mind for the business. Um, One was a digital path and the other was an in-person typical Mm -hmm. coaching path. And um, it's funny when like we really like leaned into the digital side at first Mm -hmm. thinking that that was um, going to be like kind of the way of the future. Mm -hmm. And then when we tested in the market, our clients kept saying they wanted more intimate, like personal one-on-one experiences with our coaches. And like, they really wanted more from us and they weren't, buying into the digital side not Mm -hmm. to say that it doesn't work for every everyone like it just for the clients that we were targeting yeah um, they wanted a more intimate experience so we quickly shifted gears and started leaning into um, those experiences so one-on-one coaching workplace um, coaching workplace um, presentations and like just leaning into what our clients were asking of us. So Mm -hmm. to this day, Mm -hmm. we always ask our clients, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And uh, we never stop asking that because they do tell us what they want and it helps us shape our business. So Mm -hmm. right now um, I run the business with the mantra that we do more with our clients um, rather than chasing new ones. Yeah. So we're better off to figure out how to make our clients so happy that they'll refer us to others than trying to chase new segments or like cook up new products, which we've spent four years before that, before this time, like doing stuff like that, seeing if this will stick, if that Mm -hmm. will stick. Um, and, uh, you kind of exhaust yourself after a while and, the clients, if they just keep telling you they want one or two things and they just want you to do it really well, you better to lean into that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. do you find your clients are asking for? What are some of like their kind of needs that you're seeing? Oh, this is kind of a pattern. Oh, I would say um, budgeting, mm-hmm. uh, basic budgeting, and then you escalate from there, like more mm-hmm. complex budgeting uh, shortly thereafter. Um how to effectively invest money. Mm-hmm. We don't sell investments and we can't make recommendations, but we absolutely sure can show people the ropes of like yes. how the industry works and how a portfolio is made. So we get a lot of questions about that. And then I'd say the third area has a lot to do with like interpersonal issues uh, mm. between couples where they want a better way forward. Mm -hmm. Um, They want a better way to talk to each other about finances, um, to set goals together and pull it all together in a plan. So that would be like kind of the fourth area is like planning, planning, planning. I want to plan. I feel like I'm a ship without a rudder. Yes. Um, 
you know, and, and that's what we were trying to address. We, mm-hmm. you know, we do definitely deal with, with debt from time to time. Um, but you probably deal with it maybe a little bit more, um, mm-hmm. than we do. Um, just because of the yeah. nature of like the way you've structured your business. Yeah. Um, in, in our case, our clients tend to be just a little bit older mm-hmm. and, um, maybe have kind of dug themselves out of it right? uh, or are very close to having dug themselves out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I would actually love to know more about, because it's, it's one thing dealing with an individual and their kind of individual needs, but when you're dealing with a couple and there's two people, it's almost kind of double the work is, is you're dealing with two very different. And and in most cases, they may have never really talked to each other about how they want to manage their money. What do you kind of find when you're working with couples? Oh, it's fascinating. Um, we have spent and invested a considerable amount of time and money and energy in understanding our couple clients from a cognitive behavioral therapy standpoint. So we want to know why they are doing the things that they are doing um, together and individually, um, and then mm-hmm. helping them self-solve. Uh, so giving them tools to support each other to get to those solutions, Mm -hmm. um, together. And I would say couples come in all shapes and sizes with different challenges. And, um, if we, the key is to get them aligned on a vision for their future. Mm -hmm. And once you've been able to do that, you can typically work with them. Mm -hmm. If they can't align on the vision for the future, um, there's like other, there's challenges. a bigger problem. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> we have other services for that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some couples canceling over yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it definitely like we try to help people help themselves because we know that that's where the long term and sustained um, changes come from. Yeah. Amazing. So before I let you go, uh, since you've been in this game for a very long time, I would love to know two of your kind of top tips that maybe personally helped you get to where you are or, you know, tips that you generally share with your uh, clients and your audience that uh, can maybe help some people listening right now. Um, So from, I'll do two tips, one from Mm -hmm. a business standpoint and one from like a personal finance Mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, From the business standpoint, I think the best thing that I ever did was try things that didn't work Mm -hmm. and learn from them. And I didn't repeat the same mistakes. Mm. Um, Do you find that that's an issue with lots of people that they, uh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, So I I do not think that we did things right or in a very effective way. I think we had a long and meandering path when we first started Mm -hmm. But we never, we never turned around and did it again. Right. Um, we moved forward. So mm-hmm. that was like probably uh, from a business standpoint, the best tip I can give anybody is like try it all. Yeah. yeah. And then don't do this. Don't do the stuff that didn't work before. Yeah. Don't try it again expecting a different result because most you likely it. it won't you work. It. Yeah. No, that's fair. Um, and it's easier said than done because I think naturally we want it like it's like we're comfortable with that we tried it maybe we just didn't do it maybe we'll just try it harder it's like no 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 it just didn't work let it go <laughs> Very yeah hard to do. I tell you like um you know I've caught myself doing that too but like as I guess as I get a little bit more mature and older um way less of that happens mm-hmm. um and then on the personal finance side of things um kind of the top piece of advice would be to have a plan Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many clients we have that come to us and they've never, ever taken a moment to think about what they want for the next 5, 10, 15 years. And I think a plan starts with sitting down and figuring out what do you want for your future. And then you work out the details thereafter. Mm-hmm. But having that plan is pretty critical. It can change mm-hmm. you know, once you maybe meet a partner or, um, I don't know, you change jobs yep. or you win the lottery, right? Like mm-hmm. the plan changes, but having something versus nothing will help guide and grow you, uh, mm-hmm. 
in, in such a great kind of way. Um, for me, I plan every day. Like I wake mm-hmm. up and I, I work on bullet journaling. The mm-hmm. moment I wake up, I do it over my coffee and I'm always planning, but a plan mm-hmm. makes sure that I'm focused. So yeah. I would say that'd be my, my personal finance tip, set a plan. That's a good Make one. It happen. Yeah. And it's good. You know, it's just, it's very important to have that sense of direction, but like you mentioned, it's, it's good to know the why it's like, mm-hmm. if you don't have, it's important to have the plan. And, and part of that is, is knowing why you're implementing the plan, <laughs> mm-hmm. something that you could always reference, but like, this is why I'm doing it. This is why I have to keep on doing it and, you know, stay on budget and, and, you know, kind of fulfill my financial plan. So I get to you where I want it. to go. You got awesome. it. Well, Fab, it's so nice to chat with you finally. Um, I, you. Yeah. I hope to do this again. <laughs> we yes. can talk more in depth about um, all the amazing things that you've talked about in your books. Um, before I let you go, where can people find more information about you and me best? So um, you can find all set, all, all sorts of amazing tools mm. um, on mevest.ca, M-E-V-E-S-T.ca, um, and then our associated social media accounts, um, which is at mevest money. Um, and then me personally, of which I love, I love, I love mm-hmm. like talking to people who follow mm-hmm. me personally, because it just allows us to get a little bit more intimate with what's going on in their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, my handles are at Leslie Scorgy or Leslie is my personal website. Perfect. Well, thank you again for taking the time to chat with me. Thanks, Jessica. All right. That was episode 188 of the podcast. Make sure to check out the show notes at jessicamorehouse.com slash 188. Uh, also check out uh, Leslie and Scorgy on Twitter and Instagram at uh, and her me vest, uh, me vest.ca uh, if you're interested in money coaching. Um, I've got some very important, exciting things to share with you. Um, so before I get to these things that you definitely want to stay tuned for, here's just a few words about the uh, this episode sponsor. This episode of the Mo Money podcast is supported by Sonnet Insurance. It can be pretty time consuming collecting insurance quotes to compare prices. What's great about Sonnet is that you can do it entirely online and get a quote in just minutes. Even better, if you decide to buy Sonnet Insurance, you can do that online too. It's so easy to use and understand, it really makes insurance simple. You can even see your quote update in real time if you add additional coverage or change your deductible. So you can confidently know what's in your policy and how the cost compares to competitors. Need to see it to believe it? Try it out yourself by visiting sonnet.ca. Once again, that's sonnet.ca. Okay, first and foremost, super, super important. Next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, I'm going to be doing a live and free webinar all about investing, investing. I've been getting a lot of uh, questions lately on like social media or um, just through email or just people in person uh, about investing. Um, Honestly, whenever I do a presentation or a workshop, no matter what the presentation's about, it's someone always has a question about investing. So clearly people've got some questions and I got some answers for you. So if you want to learn more about some of the most important things you need to know about investing, uh, you're going to want to join me for this webinar, jessicamorehouse.com slash webinar, or check out the show notes, jessicamorehouse.com slash 188. You're not going to want to miss it. Plus it also gives you an opportunity to um, write down some of your questions and then ask me during the Q and A at the end. So I hope to see you there. Um, some other exciting things I've got on the go. Well, if you haven't already, I highly recommend you take two seconds, go to jessicamorehouse.com slash contest, or again, check out the show notes because I'm doing a major book giveaway. Way. So basically anyone that's been on the show this season for season eight of the podcast uh, who's had a book, I am giving away their book. So let me see if I can remember all of them. Um, we've got Melissa Leong's Happy Go Money, and I'm, I'm probably going to give multiple copies away, let's be honest, because there's actually a ton of people who've been entering. So I don't want to be a jerk and just give away like one copy when like thousands of people are entering. But I'm probably going to give away uh, more than one copy. So super excited. So there's um, Melissa Leong's Happy Go Money. There is... Um, 
Shanalee Simmons, Living Debt Free. We've got Tanya Hester's uh, Work Optional. And if you listened to last week's uh, podcast episode, I am also giving away a copy of Nathan Lodka's How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital. Whoo! And you know what? I have more authors coming on the show, um, and I'm going to be giving away more books. So if you want to enter to win one of those books, jessicamorehouse.com slash contest. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, before I let you go, there's some amazing people who've been leaving me some iTunes reviews, and I want to give them some shout outs. So here we go. All right, first one is from Kale Gray uh, from Canada. Jessica is brilliant. I've learned so much from this podcast. Must listen. Short and sweet, just how I like it. Thank you so much, Kale. Uh, next is from Raya D from Canada. Authentic and relatable podcast, not intimidating for someone just starting to explore the world of finance. Thank you so much. Um, just a few more. Uh, this one is from HS Richie from Canada. Jessica, I am so grateful for what you do. I was feeling frustrated with all these quote unquote experts, not explaining things in a way I could understand. I started to think that I was just stupid. Then in my job, I started taking on more and more complex billing cases. And uh, as I explained them to others, I thought maybe I am smart. And, uh, you know, no one had been explaining things in a language I could understand. And now I have you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That is the nicest, most specific, like, uh, review. I just appreciate that so much. I, I honestly really do. Cause honestly, so I got email. Here's some, here's some tea, uh, not really tea, but here's just some info that you may not know about me. Um, I get an email once a week from this service that, um, shares me these, uh, reviews or whatever. So I have them all in one place and they usually come on a Sunday morning or whatever. And that one came in and I was so like, so just, I don't know, humbled by it. I, I, you know, had to tell my husband about it and yeah, he, he, he cares. He sort of cares. He doesn't really care. Um, okay. One more. Um, this is from, uh, Ames or Amy E from a London, I guess, London, Ontario, Canada. Um, I just love these podcasts. I have learned so much and never expect to find it so enjoyable listening to a finance podcast. I know, right? Um, Jessica really knows her stuff and her delivery is so genuine and refreshing. I highly recommend this podcast. Well, thank you so much, Amy and everyone else who let me, left me a review. Um, if you want to, you know, get a shout out on a future episode, cause why not? Um, and make my day because y'all are so nice. Um, just take two seconds out of your day. Give me a review. It's super easy peasy. Um, and I'll love you forever. It's me an iTunes review. Just, just please, 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 please. Okay. Anyways, enough of that. I'm going to be back here next Wednesday with a fresh new episode. So I look forward to seeing you then have a good rest of your week.